celebrating and showcasing extraordinary people who are doing incredible things to make our world a better place. This is Close Up Television. I'm your host, Jim Masters, and thanks for joining us. On today's episode, we celebrate Sally Riggs. Sally is a psychologist and polyvagal coach who helps COVID long haulers, people suffering with long COVID, understand how to navigate the different states of their nervous system and to improve vagal flexibility and tone. Once they can do that, long haulers can spend more time in a rest and digest state so that their body can start the healing process and ultimately enhance physical and mental health. Long COVID, recognized as a physiological and vascular disease, is in fact associated with the nervous system, which mediates many of the symptoms enhanced in the disease and experienced, such as chest pain, shortness of breath, increased heart rate, nausea, dizziness, and so much more. Sally says she's here to help COVID long haulers move out of extreme chronic fatigue and into recovery so they can find joy and meaningful activity again. She knows it's possible because she once experienced it herself. Now to learn more about Sally's incredible journey and how she's helping so many people suffering with long COVID, she joins me in the close-up television studio for this exclusive interview. Sally, welcome to Close Up Television. It's so nice to see you here, and thanks for coming up to the studio. We did the radio shows on Close Up Radio, and that was such a fascinating conversation. I wanted to come to our studio so we can dig more into your life and your journey and, and some of the wonderful things you're doing helping your clients. Welcome. Thank you so much, Jim. I'm excited to be here. You know, on the radio show, we talked about something called covid long haulers. Yeah. Now, some people may be aware of what that is and others may be saying, well, what's COVID long hauler? You know, I'm testing and I'm testing negative, so I should be good to go. But there are people who are suffering with ongoing symptoms as a result of having that initial COVID, right? Tell us about that. Yeah, so um, long haulers is a term that uh, we came up with kind of in the community of people who have experienced this illness uh, to refer to ourselves that we're in it for the long haul. Um, and long COVID, um, which uh, is kind of another kind of community term, um, is referring to uh, this idea that uh, many of us contract COVID, experience acute COVID for the sort of 10 day period, um, and either think that we have recovered, but a few months later start to get sick again, or, and uh, some people also have the second experience whereby they never really seem to recover fully at all, and then they also continue to get worse. Mm. Um, so the official definition um, and the NIH term is post-acute sequelae of COVID or PASC. Um, and I think technically they're defining it as symptoms that re don't resolve um, a month later. I would say that's a little bit too soon. I think a lot of people, um, and you probably know many people who've had COVID, even at a month are still struggling a little bit yeah. with fatigue or mm -hmm. a persistent cough or something like that. Um, but long COVID or, or long haulers, uh, we're really thinking about three months and longer. And, and sadly, I had COVID March 2020, so we're, gosh, now coming up on three years. Um, thankfully, I am doing much better now, but for a long period of time, I was very sick. Um, and I still have clients coming to me. Uh, even this week, I spoke to some new clients who had gotten sick around the same time that I had three years ago and have been sick this whole time. Is there something about that time period? Is it that we didn't have the treatments? We didn't know much about it? Was yeah. there a different strain of it that was stronger or something about that time? I mean, it's interesting because I think there are some factors around that. And yet people are still getting long COVID even from recent infections now. Um, there's definitely 
those of us in that initial wave, obviously very little access to testing, uh, nobody had had a vaccine, there was no treatment, um, so none of this, no, you know, monoclonal antibodies or antivirals or some of the things that we can get access to now. Um, and uh, definitely there are some thoughts that that initial strain was pretty, you know, serious. Obviously lots of people died, yeah. millions. Um, and, and yet um, we do still see people um, in the last year with the Omicron variant um, who perhaps were even vaccinated and boosted before they got COVID for the first time and yet do still go on and get long COVID. Um, and it may be, and obviously we don't have the long-term data yet, that their recovery journey will be quicker we don't know, um, but for many of us from that first wave, certainly three years has not been quick. No, not at no. all. So when people think of COVID, they're thinking of those symptoms of the fatigue, the, lo the losing of the taste and smell, mm -hmm. uh, coughing and sneezing, sore throat, some symptoms like headache for some people, some people maybe even nausea. Are those the kind of symptoms that we're talking about, almost like flu-like that yeah. are extended, or are there other stranger, odder symptoms that they're finding? Yeah, that's a really important question. I, definitely other stranger symptoms. Um, so it's possible to have persistent loss of taste and smell. It's possible to have persistent cough. Um, I think at last count, 211 possible symptoms included under the long COVID umbrella. 211? Yeah. So a lot more than just those kind of cold and flu type things that we see from acute COVID. Um, the main three that are talked about a lot are fatigue, uh, brain fog, and post-exertion malaise. And um, I'm hearing more and more these days from people who've had COVID recently that brain fog is is much more recognized and, and noticed now. Um, so guessing brain fog is not unusual. Um, but again, I think it's, it's the severity of it. I mean, I certainly had, when you're in it, it's less noticeable. When I started to recover and, and had those moments of clarity again, then you realize just how bad the brain fog was. And I certainly had moments where I was thinking, my goodness, I probably shouldn't have been working. Um, you know, no wonder I missed things. You know, yeah. no wonder my business is in a bit of a mess on the back end, yeah. you know. Um, so brain fog, it sounds like a, you know, you've got a mild hangover or something, but really we're talking about brain damage, cognitive impairment. Um, significant neurological symptoms, essentially. Um, and fatigue, I think, again, is a term that we use it in kind of everyday usage, you know, I'm so tired, um, oh, I'm very fatigued, and it doesn't really mean that. Um, I was really the sickest for the whole of 2021, and for me, fatigue would mean that I wouldn't really sleep very well at all. And so I would wake up not feeling refreshed in any way. And your body just feels so heavy that even the process of getting out of bed, you know, if it's winter, putting on a sweater, finding some socks or slippers or something just right. to make it to the bathroom right. was enough to wipe me out. Almost sounding a little bit like what people have vaguely dealt with that Epstein-Barr virus sort very, of thing. Very, very similar. A weird sort of just yeah. vague Post -viral. exhaustion yeah. without even exerting. Yes. And a continuation of that. Yeah. Similar to that, but, but stronger. Yes. And, and potentially going on for a long, long time. Um, so that's, you've been dealing with that. Yeah. Still dealing with that today? Or is that less Still a little you? bit. I mean, you know, I got up early this morning to, to come and meet you here to, to talk to you today. Was that and an effort? Yeah. I was not bounding out of bed and uh, raring to go. And you used to. Yeah. You were like, yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm an ultra yeah. marathon runner. I used yeah. to get up 6 a.m., throw on my shoes, go out and run and, and then start my day. Which would surprise people because a lot of people probably think, oh, well, then somebody who's got... Uh, Somebody who even gets COVID and then somebody who's a long hauler yeah. is somebody who probably maybe they didn't take care of themselves, right. they have the underlying causes, there's obesity, they are not a marathon runner. Right. So this obviously won't happen to me if I am. Yes. 
and, and I and I hear that all the time. Oh, I'm person. fit. I'm young. I'm healthy. I'll be fine. And what we're actually finding, and um, you know, the long COVID community, thankfully, has really come together and supporting each other. That a huge proportion of us are athletes who were very healthy, who didn't have pre-existing conditions, who are dealing with the long. Yeah. Yeah. Is there have they deduced why that would be? Um, that is a really good question too. I think, and again, I, I'm not a, a medical doctor, although these days sometimes you're I feel like I get an honorary right, degree right, exactly and, on yeah. top of my psychology degree. Um, that it, something around certainly it is well known that athletes who are at the peak of fitness and training uh you know whatever their sport is the the season in which they're racing or competing or what have you um at that level of fitness the immune system actually runs slightly suppressed because they're pushing and pushing yeah. and and going. and so uh, the vulnerability for things like autoimmune uh, is greater. Yes. And we don't know for sure the underlying causes of long COVID, uh, but definitely autoimmune seems to be involved. Uh, for those that don't know autoimmune, the idea that the immune system gets switched on so aggressively that it then starts to attack other parts of the body that are not virus mm. that are healthy tissue and then that obviously causes problems and, and snowballs. Um, so I think that's potentially a factor. Um, I think the other factor which is is definitely a big part of the risk picture for long COVID um, is that athletes are also often type A driven people. And type A driven people seemingly are also vulnerable for long COVID. Um, and part of the reason behind that, and, and this is really where my work as a long COVID coach comes in, um, this thing called the autonomic nervous system um, and polyvagal theory. Um, so the autonomic nervous system, and you may remember this from high school, you're sympathetic and you're parasympathetic, and supposedly they're in equilibrium. Um, so parasympathetic is your rest and digest, sympathetic is your fight or flight, and that all of us at some point need fight or flight, um, either to get away from a threat or... If we're, you know, presenting on a TV show and we yeah. want to be performing yeah. at our right. best right. Uh, or or if we're running a race or if we're in sports, you know, people use that sympathetic activation uh, for positive things. And athletes are much more likely to be hanging around in that sympathetic activation um, because they're performing at that high level. And what we actually know um, from a researcher named Professor Stephen Porges, uh, who worked at the University of Indiana for a very long time, uh, he's now down in Florida, um, he came up with this thing called polyvagal theory. Um, and he added a third level to not just parasympathetic and sympathetic, um, but what we sometimes refer to as the freeze response, um, or in its fancy, I think probably Latin word, is dorsal vagal. Mm -hmm. um, and the vagus nerve uh, is the nerve in the autonomic nervous system that is responsible for all these processes, uh, hence polyvagal, because we've now got three levels, not just two. Um, and what he has shown in research with animals uh, and also now doing a lot of work with humans, is that if we spend too much time in fight or flight, mm. it's not sustainable for the body. High stress, high cortisol, inflammation, all of, all that. of these things. Exactly. It's like an engine for your car constantly running. Yeah, and, and you do a lot of damage. Out. Yeah. And so the body is naturally trying to prevent that. Once and at a certain point, it will just sort of pull the ripcord and that freeze... Uh, was that you? Down. Yeah. Were you that person? Were you definitely. always on? And, definitely. And, uh... So pre-COVID, uh, I'm a psychologist by training, and I've been working in the U.S. since 2008. Um, I have been in New York since 2011, and I started my own private practice 2015. So that would be five years when COVID hit. 
Uh, I had a big office on 45th Street in Midtown. I had a group practice with about five or six other psychologists working for me. Um, I would sublet some of those offices to other therapists. I know what um, you're saying were and was. Yeah. It was busy. It was hectic. Yeah. It was stressful. And in all honesty, if I look back, those are the sort of natural progressions with a psychotherapy practice, especially in New York. You start out by yourself, and then as you want to expand and, well. and grow, and I've always been an ambitious person, that's naturally what you do. And yet, I was definitely aware that my body didn't really feel comfortable. I was exhausted constantly. And this idea of pushing on through that athletes talk a lot about too, we are not afraid to push on through. I have run a 50K race in my lifetime, and a big portion of that was not, uh, you know, rainbows and puppies. And yet, we're very good at pushing on through. So I'd been pushing on through for a long, long time before COVID came along. And the stress of that novel virus to our bodies that no human had ever experienced before um, is obviously, again, another thing that's going to trigger the fight or flight response. And then initially, those of us who caught COVID in that first wave, obviously that there was a lot of anxiety, mm -hmm. there was a lot of uncertainty, especially in New York. I mean, my goodness, New York had a horrific People time. People were dying, things were yeah. closing, life was stopping, exactly. changing. Exactly, absolutely Incomes terrifying. Incomes were stopping, everything. Broadway yeah. shut, and yeah. the whole world was, the whole city was stopping. Was Nobody knew silent. what it was. It was yeah. like this wave of... Yeah. And you contract that virus in that context, and, and everybody's thinking, am I going to die? It's because every earth, day right? we hear the numbers coming up. So if you're already someone who's driven, if you're already someone who is type A... And likes to be ahead of the curve. And you're um, already running with your immune system slightly suppressed, and, and then a that... A warrior, maybe, a yeah, overthinker. Absolutely. And being a psychologist also taking yeah. on what you're hearing that other people are dealing with Absolutely. constantly yeah. and trying to help them through yeah. it. So it's... Yeah. I mean, for me, I got sick literally as we transitioned to working from home and telemedicine and patients were very, very anxious and I didn't want them to know that I was sick because I didn't want them to worry. I was a lifeline for them each week, uh, you know, somebody that they knew they could talk to about their fears and their worries. And um, so I, I didn't tell anybody that I had COVID. I worked right the way through that acute infection. I, I mean, uh, most people watching this will have had COVID, so you, you know what it feels like. I was very fortunate that I did not get the cough. I did not get the cough. I had horrible body aches, chills, mm. fatigue. Lose the taste and smell. I got a metallic mm. taste. Mm. Um, I have a friend who yeah. had that. Yeah. And it was just right before they started talking about it publicly. And right at that time when there wasn't very much in the grocery store in New York and it was hard to get food. And I literally threw out everything in my fridge because I thought it had gone bad. Right. And then about five hours later, I heard that that was a natural part of COVID. And I was very frustrated because it was hard to get food <laughs> to replace it. And throw out $100 worth of food. <laughs> Especially eggs. Eggs were like gold Which dust. Which now they're like $30 a yes. dozen. <laughs> also gold dust again. Um, what so, are the other symptoms that you experienced yeah. too, in addition to the fatigue and the metallic taste? Other I, things? It was, it was really body. just like a, a flu and like the, the worst flu that I had ever had. But in all honesty, it was relatively mild. And I think most people that I know that have long COVID also had relatively mild infections. What are you dealing with today? Very, very different than that. Like so, you're even positioned a certain yeah, way in this Yeah, so I, I have to result. be mindful of my nervous system constantly because the work that I had to do to get out of that chronic free state has been a lot and, and continues. I think I still, on a daily basis, I think I'm doing fine and then I remember and I constantly wear one of these lovely Garmin watches uh, other watches also exist um, that do the heart rate monitor. So mm. I'm constantly checking my heart rate because that's an indicator that you're going into fight or flight is that your heart rate has gone up. And one of the symptoms that people with long COVID all experienced is 
uh, both high heart rate and then elevated heart rate in unusual situations. So my resting heart rate historically as a runner would have been around 60, 65. Sitting here talking to you, it's currently high 80s, low 90s, which is pretty good given that we're talking. Well, the lights talking. and cameras will add to exactly. that. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. It's a normal setting. No, but I'm doing but a lot better. There doing... were times when I was really sick where that would have been 120 higher, or 130 just sitting. At a resting state. Yeah. You know, my thought is, if you're already somebody who is type A, who's always thinking and, and maybe even trying to prevent problems before they happen, um, dealing with this situation might have your heart rate up anyway. Yeah. How, are you, because of this, has this added a situation in your life where you're basically now walking on eggshells. You'll only go to certain places. Yeah. In order to be around people, yeah. they must test negative. Has, has it altered your life I mean, in an unusual way? Definitely. I mean, and it, it's trying to balance. So we, we don't want to encourage our body to be on eggshells more than it needs to. So I definitely... You know, I'm living my life in a very different way now, right from the minute that I wake up. I'm thinking about my nervous system. I'm paying attention to my nervous system. I'm much more tuned in to the cues that I might be going into fight or flight or shut down. And then I have lots of teeny tiny little strategies that I'm constantly do. doing throughout the day. Because some people yeah. could get so worried that they become almost like a hypochondriac, whether yeah. They're more worried during the day than they are even enjoying the day and joyful. Absolutely. And that's one of the things I think with long COVID that we also struggle with is because the medical community hasn't quite caught up to where we are it's yet. All new, yeah. And they don't have clear treatment pathways and answers. It's very easy when you and most people are self-diagnosing initially before yeah. they can even get a confirmation from a doctor. It's very easy then to spend the whole day on the Internet going down a rabbit hole looking mm. for treatments for long COVID and looking up the limited research that we have and trying to find docs who will prescribe this and prescribe that and prescribe the other. And all of that is going to exacerbate the nervous system and put you much more into sympathetic and then you'll just go back into freeze again as a result of that. Um, so it's, it's, it's balancing the risk and also trying to keep your body feeling safe. And the fascinating thing about the autonomic nervous system and polyvagal theory, and I've been a psychologist for 20 years and I didn't know any of this stuff. Um, so in a way that's been a silver lining that I've gotten to learn about all of this. Um, that's, the cues for safety are all sort of subconscious. Mm -hmm. Cognitively, I know in certain situations that I'm safe and my brain can be saying to my body, you're fine, you know, we're sitting here, it's just you and I. You look There's great. no threats uh, yeah. in this room. Right, yeah. Um, and yet things could be happening that could make my nervous system think, wait a second, there might be something we should be worrying about here. And so we, I need to be constantly, and, and the clients that I work with long, with long COVID, that's part of the work that we're doing, is reversing those little cues with other little things that we can do. Mm. So for example, right now, I have a five pound weighted blanket on my lap that is just making my body feel a little bit more safe. And I also have a little, cushion behind my back that is also making my body feel a little bit more safe. When I'm sitting at my desk, I And when you say have, safe, safe from yeah. disease, illness, or safe from... And I think it, it's all wrapped up together that when the autonomic nervous system says we need to do fight or flight, that can be because of threat from illness, because of mm. threat from violence because it's of made you more hyper vigilant yeah. yeah yeah right and the other thing that we're seeing is that um and and this is again an interesting kind of psychological area of research to get into that a lot of people had pre-existing trauma 
and they may not have been aware of it, that mm. also made them vulnerable to long COVID. Because we know, and, and, and even something as seemingly small as a complicated birth story, which mm. again is not my area of expertise as a, as a psychologist rather than a physician, but there are certain things about the way in which we're born that can make the body internally, biologically store that trauma and carry that and make... Prematurity or anything right, that could right. have happened. Spending time in the ICU or um, being a C-section or, you know, any of those kinds of experiences that obviously none of us have memory of that far right. back, um, that our bodies do have memory of. And if you have a certain number of traumatic things that you've been through in your lifetime, the body doesn't need an actual threat now to go into that freeze response. It just does it automatically for safety. So you were saying your nervous system has been affected. Yeah. Um, also vascular as well? Yeah, so what is looking um, in terms of the research like the, the main pathology that is causing long COVID um, is these things called microclots. And it is getting talked a little bit more about now. And I know certainly in the news, there have been people who have had um, strokes or heart attacks post COVID, um, and they are connecting that to microclots and this clotting pathology. Um, and, and what is thought by, uh, there's a group of scientists in South Africa that are working very hard on this, um, is that the spike protein COVID um, is damaging the endothelial lining, which is the lining of the blood vessels. And normally that lining is healthy and it allows normal blood to just pass through normally. But once it gets damaged, it interferes with the blood and causes these microclots to form, which for you and I who are not physicians, basically means sticky blood. And if you've got sticky blood, first and foremost, it doesn't move through as well. It's like almost like a cholesterol, yeah. Right, but also it's gonna affect all of your organs. So some people do have heart problems, some people do have ch uh, lung problems, some people have neurological problems, but also uh, a lot of gut and GI distress, all the way down to people are having neuropathy in their toes or tingling feelings, loss of sensation in their legs. So obviously the whole body is affected by something like microclots or sticky blood. Um, and now that we're three years in and we have this information, then that's, it, it feels to me again, going back to safety, knowing that, I feel safer understanding how this works a little bit more. Are you dealing with that as well, the vascular part? Yeah, yeah. And and I, that's not so easy because um, not, not every doctor acknowledges this theory um, and getting the research done and published is not easy. So right now there is a pilot study that has been done looking at these microclots and treating them with only 24 patients. And um, it's in preprint, which means that it hasn't been peer reviewed yet and it hasn't been published. Um, but the data looks good. Um, and I have found a physician who was able to prescribe me a combination of anticoagulants um, that definitely clinically feels like it has helped me. Um, of course, I have to wear the fun little Medi bracelet the whole time so that people know that you're on anticoagulants, which many people watching this might be anyway from other, you know, heart related or, or vascular issues. Um, but it's not widely accepted, unfortunately. And so it's not easy to find doctors who will prescribe and- Are people trying to find alternative methods? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Searching for yeah. hope, however they can find it. Absolutely, yeah. And, and it's a complicated picture because it's not just, you know, if you would just take the anticoagulants, that's not a magic fix. Um, all of these elements are working together and and definitely what I find and 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 a big part of the work that I do coaching clients with long COVID is that if your nervous system is not able to be in rest and digest even for a tiny bit of the day, 
the medical treatments themselves are not going to work because your body needs to be in that state for the healing to be able to happen. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's so important. What are some other symptoms that you've heard your clients tell you that they've been experiencing? Yeah. I mean, the other big one that is talked about a lot, and this really does overlap um, with with the athletes, is the post-exertion malaise. So you've got the fatigue on the one hand that you wake up and you don't feel rested, and then you've got post-exertion malaise, whereby if you do a very small amount of anything... Just clean the it, kitchen it or... It knocks you out again. Vacuum the rugs or yeah. go for a quick walk. Yeah, or, groceries. or it can also be something emotional or something cognitive. So a quick Zoom can call wipe you out. or reading your work emails or having mm. a difficult exchange with a colleague that was maybe a little bit, you know, strained and triggers some Gets emotions. Revving and... Then also that can cause post exertion malaise as well. Mm. Yeah. So many incredible things. And they're just yeah. still discovering more yeah. symptoms and, and things that they're tying to yeah. the long haul COVID. How do you determine that it's long haul COVID? You know, when you have a headache, yeah. they give you an aspirin and it subsides. Yeah. When is it when it's a, this is officially long haul COVID? Yeah, I mean, we, we don't have two. a diagnostic test. Right. So the official diagnosis still says, having ruled out all other things. and That it must be that. Yeah, I think the difficulty is that most docs, and, and certainly the way that healthcare works in the US, is that they want to do all of their tests looking for the other things. And then quite often if all of those tests come back negative they don't say oh i think you've got long covid they just say great news all your tests you are negative you don't have a tumor you don't have this you don't have that and the That's person just, is uh, not fine yeah sit it out and it'll yeah. resolve itself yeah we don't even know if that's the case we don't no and and many of us have managed to make a recovery typically through interventions like the one that i offer um tell us about that what are some yeah. things that can be done to help people who are going through long haul COVID? Yeah, I mean, the the thing that was a real turning point for me and how I really got into this polyvagal theory stuff um, was an intervention called the Safe and Sound Protocol. And that uh, was also created by uh, Professor Stephen Porges. It is uh, auditory intervention, music, uh, five hours in total, of special music that has been frequency manipulated. And what they have done is they've taken out high frequency and low frequency, and you're left with the middle frequency, which essentially is the equivalent of human speech. And I don't know if you took psychology in like undergrad. The sound of a cello is similar. Oh, yeah. yes. Yeah. yeah. So um, what it's getting at is um, those Psych 101 experiments with babies and attachment, where you have the mother and she's talking in that lovely sing-song voice, and the baby is all calm and relaxed and attached to the mother. And then you tell the mother, to stop talking and make her face also just completely still. And you watch the baby slowly melt down over a period of minutes as its nervous system kicks into fight or flight. And then you have the mother go back to talking in the sing-song voice and you watch the baby just settle and calm itself. And this music, which um, follows a special copyrighted algorithm, um, and you can, fascinatingly, you can listen to it they have popular music tracks, but they also have classical music tracks following the same algorithm of the same frequency manipulation. It sounds like it's great even if you don't have yeah. COVID. Oh, absolutely. It's just good I, for I mean, I would recommend yeah. and it, what it does. So you use this with yeah, your Yeah, I came across it completely unrelated to my work as a psychologist, my primary what do they call it, care music for COVID or what are they? It's it's an intervention that originally was used uh, with kids with autism. Mm. And so uh, yeah. a lot of occupational therapy practices right. offer it. Um, and then other kind of complementary holistic type practitioners. Um, my primary care physician who does work with long COVID and has been wonderful um, recommended it to me September 2021. 
And when I looked into the science behind it, it was the first thing that, oh my goodness, this absolutely makes sense. This is exactly what I need. And when I called the company to find out about it and they quoted me the price, in my mind, I would already have paid 10 times that happily because I knew this is it. This is what my body needs. I'm assuming there's probably no heavy metal guitars in that. No, no, there isn't. <laughs> it's, it's much more of a... Yeah, yeah. it's mellow. Yeah. But you listen to it very, very, very slowly. Yeah. So although it's five hours, it took me about three months. It sort of builds. Yeah. And what it's doing is it's working on the muscles of the middle ear. And it's the analogy that the muscles of the middle ear connect into the top of that vagus nerve where it meets the brainstem, right in the back of the brain. And um, what you're looking to do is increase flexibility and tone in that vagus nerve mm. to help you move more easily between fight or flight, rest and digest, mm. and freeze. Rather than getting stuck in one or bouncing between the two at the bottom, you want to be able to move much more volitionally because we need all three states. Sounds, certain sounds can throw you into that fight yeah. or flight stage. Yeah. Certain sounds that you hear that are jarring or piercing or... Absolutely. Wow, that's really fascinating. Yeah, it's... and the, the analogy they use, uh, Jim, is like uh, an elastic band. If you've got a brand new elastic band and it's very tight, if you pull it very quickly, it will just snap and yeah. you won't have an elastic band anymore. Right. But if you just very gently stretch it and then let it go back and then stretch and let it go back, over time, it you becomes... can get a huge elastic band right. and it still does what it's supposed to do. It still has its structural integrity. I've tried that stretching with my wallet, but it doesn't seem to work. <laughs> it doesn't no. seem to work with the wallet. No. Not Sadly. with leather, no. <laughs> unfortunately. Only with elastic. So somebody watching this saying, you know, I think maybe I do have long haul COVID. Yeah. yeah. Um, what is the process like when they contact you? What are the, do you do an assessment? What is the initial yeah. process like? So I offer a free uh, discovery call. And you can schedule one of those just by going to my website. Um, and we will talk a little bit about, first and foremost, what is the dream life that you want to get forward to in the future? Because most people with long COVID have been sick for so long and their life has gotten so small. And they're sad and frustrated and yeah, emotionally. And very, yeah. very, very tough. And so they have forgotten even the possibility that they can get better, even the hope that they can have a life again. So that's where we start. And then I will check in, what are the symptoms that you're experiencing? What are the treatments that you've tried? What's working, what's not working? And then we'll talk a little bit about the autonomic nervous system and does that resonate for them? And does that make sense? And, and then if it feels like a good fit, then we talk about um, working together through coaching. I would imagine because you have this uh psychology background that that is a very big part of this as well yeah. you you pull from that in helping your clients yeah. through because there is that emotional component absolutely and it has been it, it's so fascinating I mean I had been a psychologist for a very long time and I had become I have a very um, particular specialty that is very rare in the U.S., which is part of why I came here and What's stayed here. Uh, CBT for psychosis, cognitive behavioral therapy uh, for things like voices, visions, paranoia, suspiciousness. Um, so I had spent a long time building that career, and um, I was actually uh, one of the founding members and the first president of the North American CBT for Psychosis Network, really kind of championing that work in this country and in Canada and also Mexico. Um, and yet when I got sick with long COVID and then when I came across the Safe and Sound Protocol and polyvagal theory and started to recover, it just felt so clear to me that I needed to be working with people with long COVID that I have really pivoted um, and, you Made know, this is a central focus yeah, now. Yeah, this is, is it's an underserved. Yeah. 60% of, of my week, maybe more than when, that 75. When I interviewed you on Close Up radio and yeah. you mentioned, you know, the psychology background and everything else. And then you mentioned long COVID, you know, long COVID coach, long yeah. haul COVID coach. 
I hadn't heard of that before, even yeah. myself. I'm like, wow, that's a specialty and that's an underserved area. Yeah. So you took the knowledge and experience that you've got and sort of uh, fine-tuned it for what's relevant and happening right now. Yeah. And you're really serving an underserved population. I think, and, and there's sort of three elements within that, Jim. So the first is that people with long COVID are so overwhelmed because there aren't clear treatment pathways, because the docs don't fully understand, and it's the luck of the draw when you speak to your PCP, mm. whether they even know what long COVID is or not. And when you hear long haul anything or chronic anything, yeah. it's, it's scary. scary. It's yeah. it's saddening because, you yeah. mean, long haul, how long is that a long haul? Yeah, haul? exactly. Yeah. And that's a question I get a lot um, either do you think I can recover because the person really doesn't? Or even they'll just say to me, I'd lost all hope and thank yeah. you for representing the possibility that I can or recover. Or will I even get worse? Yeah, absolutely. And, and initially when the body is still in that sympathetic activation, it's so easy to get caught up in, I'm never going to get better. This is going to be awful. This is awful. it for me. And, and, and noticing little, th oh my gosh, I am getting worse. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it is very, very, very scary. And because I have been there, and I would really say it is the worst thing a human can go through. Did you say why me? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I was so furious for such a long time. And, um, you know, because, again, a phrase that's very commonly shared within the long COVID community that I'm, I lost my life, but I'm still alive. And that's no way to live. Mm. And, and in the midst of the pandemic, mm. when most people, having been through lockdowns and re, you know, everybody did some, you know, some navel gazing and some reconsidering of their life and their priorities. And, and there was a big thing that came out of it. Life's too short. We should live for today. Well, when today is hell, you don't want to live for that. And when there's no hope of a future being any different, it's really, really hard. Mm. Um, and so having somebody who can represent hope and can help people put together their own treatment path, their own recovery path, so that they can have some efficacy um, in their own recovery journey, because it, it the hopelessness that, that sets in when you get to that place is just awful. And very sadly, we have lost many people to suicide from that being in that place with long COVID. Mm. Um, so... It's like hearing you yeah. have cancer. Yeah. It's the other C word, right? Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So what's going and to happen? And... Not wanting to minimize cancer. Cancer has treatment pathways. Right. Long COVID doesn't. Right. And that that makes it infinitely Even more because yeah. it's still yeah it's the unknown yeah. So you mentioned music yeah. Uh, what are some other treatments? Uh, is is there medication involved? Are there other things? Yeah. Or, uh, meditation, uh, EFT tapping. I mean, is there a lot of different things you've tried? There are lots of different things that people can try. I obviously, as a psychologist, am not a licensed prescriber. Um, but what I can do is help people look at the existing research evidence that we have around possible medications that they might want to ask for from their physicians. And if they don't have a physician who is amenable to that type of work, um, having worked with a lot of people throughout the US and also internationally, I'm also pretty good at helping people find docs who do know what they're doing and can help them get to the right meds that might be helpful to them. Um, so that's a big part of the work that we do together. Um, and then absolutely looking at all the possible things that a person can be doing to support the nervous system. And for some people, meditation is really helpful. For some people, yoga is really helpful. Deep breathing, depending on how your lungs are doing post COVID. Um, and there can be a bit of breathing rehab that can be done there to, to help out. Um, and, and then there's lots of, so those are sort of what we think about as big things, right? So some had to change their lifestyle, yeah. their diet, yeah. their careers. I mean, different yeah, absolutely. Uh, relationships. I mean, and and I, I think I'm also a walking example of that, Jim, that I really have 
reconstructed my entire life right. from scratch. Right. Um, and the way that I function, that big group practice that I mentioned does not exist anymore. All of those lovely psychologists are now working independently. That office is no longer mine. I'm sure it's there and I'm sure it still looks lovely, but it doesn't have my lovely furniture in it. Um, so it I must have, have been a difficult decision. Yeah. And, and it was, I mean, there's a big grief process with letting yeah, things go sure. and, and it was incremental, definitely. Yeah. Um, most people come to work with me at a point when they are either thinking about taking medical leave from work or already have taken medical leave for a while. And so often some of the coaching work we do together is thinking about, is that a career you want to go back into? Or are, are there other things that maybe are emerging that now seem more supportive of your lifestyle and your nervous system. Um, some people, I mean, many people throughout the pandemic um, had relationship changes. There was a lot of that. Yeah, a lot of people what, got divorced. People were home yeah. and they spent time with each other. They yeah. forgot almost who the other person was. And yeah, yeah. there was a and lot of separation. You, and if you factor into that being sick with long COVID, and then being mindful that you have a sensitive nervous system, if you're living with somebody who is not mindful of that, then that's a thought process as to whether, you know, you want to continue in that journey with that person or you want to consider something different. Well, the great resignation, too. Yeah. A lot of people yeah. said, I'm in a corporate job or I'm doing something that is serving the company and the bottom line, but not them, yeah. not inspiring. And they want to do things that connect with yeah. people on a more humanistic level. You've seen a lot of that lately. Yeah. This this has been a and shift in just the way we think and operate. Definitely a big theme amongst long haulers is kind of coming to that self-knowledge that we all had been running on fumes for a long time before COVID hit us. And many of us, especially the athletes, were using exercise seemingly as a coping mechanism, but actually that also activates the sympathetic nervous system. And so you got a high stressful job and then your only counter to that is a high stressful sport. And people Something's gotta give. have been wondering why America was hit so hard with this, where there are some other countries that aren't even as developed as we are, yeah. that have not been hit as hard. Yeah. And some of it is this Definitely. lifestyle, this Definitely. chasing the brass ring and yeah. competitiveness and type A and All of that. working 24-7, yeah. no sleep, e eating on the run, yeah. um, adding to all of this, uh, yeah. making us vulnerable. Yeah, if you're in a culture where when you get sick, it's absolutely the norm to stay home and lie down for three months, you're definitely not gonna get long COVID. But lifestyle is very important. There are places yeah. where people do pause yeah. and they take a little bit more. I mean, they've even talked, they floated around in this country. It, they said it probably will never happen where they're talking about a four-day work week. Yeah. Um, I don't ever, unfortunately, seen that happen in America. Yeah. I, I do think also, too, that there also has been loneliness. People that have been working out of the house who are people who are people, people. Yeah. They feed off the energy yes. of other people. Yeah. What they do for a living is dependent on working the room or whatever it yeah. may be. Uh, now doing things on Zoom in, in a square box in their yeah. living room. And their nervous systems aren't going to like it's that not either. It's not giving them the creativity, the yeah. energy that they need. They need that team sort of situation. Some people are loving it because they prefer not being in the office and hearing the water cooler gossip anyway. Yes. But there's a lot of people who struggled with being yeah. cooped up, which then brings in, it makes you sort of more vulnerable to things anyway, right? It does. Illnesses so, and fascinatingly, mental health has been... One of the big components of the cues for safety that our nervous system needs is social connection. So again, going back to those psych 101, right? You've got that lovely smiling mother figure, which is giving you the attachment and making the body feel safe. And having that 
um, what we with polyvagal theory refer to as someone who's anchored in the ventral state, that lovely, mm -hmm. smiling, warm container um, of social interaction makes a huge, huge difference. And fascinatingly, I went to um, the Polyvagal Institute had their conference live again in October of last year. Um, and uh, I attended that slightly trepidatiously because it was the first in-person thing I had done. And definitely there were moments where my nervous system felt overwhelmed mm. because of the number of people and the you know when a session ends at a conference and everyone starts chatting and the noise level just goes up in that yes. big ballroom right. type conference right. room. And I really noticed that my nervous system was just a little bit aggravated by that. But having all of that social connection opportunity, chatting with people at breakfast, chatting with people at lunch, in the coffee breaks, really, really positively impacted me. And I think thinking about all of these things, we all do need social connection. And so, you know, coming out of this, whether you have long COVID, whether you don't have long COVID, whether you, whether you are someone who has been very fortunate to never contract acute COVID, but is wanting to make sure that you're not at risk for it or for, for long COVID, making sure that your nervous system and that your lifestyle is supporting your nervous system, including social connection in a way that, again, gives you cues for safety is really important. Is there anything that you don't do now? Yeah. Uh, anything that either you don't do or you don't eat, drink, consume, yeah. um, areas of life that you now avoid. Yeah. Tell us about some of the changes you've had to make where yeah. you've had to eliminate certain things. I mean, I've always eaten pretty well, again, as an athlete. Um, and one of the things that happens, sadly, as a result of the long COVID illness is metabolic dysfunction. So most of us have gained weight, and even though I'm eating a uh, largely uh, ketogenic diet, which a lot of people do very well on weight-wise, um, I am definitely 10 pounds heavier than I was when I, before I got sick. Um, There's and, a reason for that. Yeah. Because they told us during COVID that we had to be six feet away from each other, but they didn't tell us that we had to be 10 feet away from our refrigerators. Exactly. <laughs> yes. And, and, and food. It's a comfort. Yeah. Comfort. And, and whether it's eating your emotions, but also fascinatingly, if we go back to that infant attachment, putting something in your mouth is a cue for safety. Yeah. So yeah. again, potatoes and all of that, if it's a, a bag of chips. A lot of people baked bread during the pandemic yeah. and all of those they things. ate their childhood foods and yeah. things that they, you know. Yeah. Exactly. So there's definitely a, and I notice that with my body when I get to the end of, I'm working full time again now, thankfully, but I'll get to five or six o'clock and I've had a busy day with clients and I know my nervous system's depleted and I might be hungry, but I might not be hungry. And yet what I want to do is just sit and eat all evening. So I have to be mindful of that. Um, I definitely have worked hard to eliminate sugar and sugar obviously exacerbates inflammation, and inflammation is a big part of long COVID and illness generally. Oh, do you um, have a sweet tooth? Is sugar something you've craved or not? I have, and yeah. I think, again, that goes to what has happened with my gut and the kind of GI mess up as a result of COVID, which I think a lot of people also experience from acute COVID, yeah. um, that I never used to crave sweet foods. I'd never really been, I mean, I'll eat dark chocolate, but I'll eat a couple of pieces and I'll be more and than not happy. not the entire thing all at yeah, once. Yeah, right? but I definitely have had a craving for, for sweet things. And I, I have to keep very, you know, and, and I notice when I eat them that I will be really brain fog the next day. So you do see that kind of correlation with, with food. Um, I am working with uh, a functional nutritional specialist to really help me with repairing the gut um, and building back the nutrition um, and that has been fascinating. It has. So yeah. what's great about what you're sharing and you're being very revealing, very open with us like you were on the radio show mm -hmm. is uh, the relatability that you have to the, the patients or the clients that you're dealing with because, you know, they're going to be opening up and sharing things about their life with you that they might not even share with their closest loved ones and friends, yeah. their fears, everything else that they're dealing with. 
So when they realize that they're talking to somebody who's an expert, but also has been living through what they're going through, that they are yeah. sort of in a fog about and confused about, it's very reassuring for the patient or for the client that you have, which I think is fantastic. Yeah. Um, list out some of the benefits, again, of having a long-haul coach such as yourself. Yeah. Um, so in addition to thinking about treatment options and getting support around that, um, definitely having somebody who understands and is there. Um, and in terms of the way that my coaching kind of works logistically, we try to keep Zoom meetings to a minimum because obviously they're quite draining and overwhelming for folks with long COVID. Um, and yet I will use one of those walkie-talkie apps to keep in touch with my clients mm. constantly throughout the week. And so they can message me if there's something they're worried about, if there's something they're thinking about, if there's something they tried that went well. Um, and I think that's something about the difference between coaching and psychology that I really like. You know, coaching, you are there for somebody sort of minute to minute, literally coaching them through. Um, psychology is very much more boundaried and you've got your 45 minute session and then no personal information is, no. is shared. No. As a psychologist, you know, my patients never knew anything about me at all. Whereas folks in the long COVID community know my whole story, my whole life. Um, and you're like or a at friend. Least, yeah. And so it, it is much more, the power dynamic is not there. And, and it is much more, uh, you know, somebody who's further along in the recovery journey helping someone who's further back. Has there been any plus side? in any of this for you? Yeah. Has it changed you, opened you up more? What are some things uh, where you've been able to take the yeah. lemons and make some lemonade from this experience, eye-opening experience? Yeah, I, and I think that has also been a process too, Jim, because I uh, there were a lot of people early on in the long COVID community that were talking about silver linings. And as I've said before, I was very angry for a long time and I was certainly not ready to see that. Um, and, and so you definitely have to be in a place where you are experiencing more rest and digest more frequently to have access to things like gratitude and compassion and acceptance. But I definitely have gotten to that place now. And um, you know, if it weren't for long COVID, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. I wouldn't have this opportunity for, for us to have met and for us to be filming this today. Um, I, you know, used to do public speaking in my old job as a psychologist, but the opportunities that have opened up to me now with this new topic are, are much, much bigger. And more of a deeper connection with people. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and the opportunity to restructure my life in this way, I think... Uh, Many of us now consider long COVID our bodies giving us a wake up call mm. that the lifestyle yeah. we were living was not sustainable. And for years, our bodies had been trying to tell us that and we just didn't get the message. And, right. and now I do. So going back to your question of things that I don't do anymore, I'm also incredibly boundaried about what I want to do and what I don't want to do. Have you given up the belly dancing or? <laughs> uh, that one never worked for me, Jim. I was never very good at that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, people and, and. And that's the thing. You have to have levity. Yeah. You have to laugh. You oh, have goodness. to have humor because yeah. yeah. it releases those feel good endorphins. It definitely you have does. to. Because yeah. if we're all wound up and so tight all the time and we yeah. we don't laugh at all and relax, your body wants to smile. And, it does. and there are things in life, no matter what we're thrown is thrown at us, that we can still smile about. Yeah. Right? yeah. And I, and I and I and that's I think the place that I have gotten to now, that I am really and truly grateful for this experience, which I certainly wouldn't have said to you two years ago. Um, you wouldn't have laughed at that. No, I would have told you where to go with, with, with some choice words. <laughs> You're on the road to recovery. Yes. Um, but in terms of, you know, social connection is important. We all get invited to things. 
I now will say to myself, do I really want to go to this? Right. If, because, because I don't have boundless energy, right. even still. Right. And so I have to be mindful, is this person worth my time? Exactly. There have been some friendships that I have that, reconsidered yeah, that a... maybe that weren't a great fit. And, and we all have, you know, people in our lives that were taking all of our energy and that weren't giving anything taking back. Taking energy, right, sucking the yeah. life out, toxic yeah. negativity. Absolutely. So how to be mindful of what I need and, and truly putting that first, which isn't selfish, because if I'm well, then I can help all these other people as well. And I can, you know, the energy that I get yeah. that then flows through me to other yeah. people is, is important. So, yes, things that I don't do anymore, places that I don't go yeah. anymore, people that I don't see or that I see them in a certain way. I'll show up when I can on my terms and I'll leave when I can on my terms. And and being much more mindful of those things. You didn't used to do that, right? No. You would be the last one to leave yeah. and Yeah. yeah. And I, and much I get more that, me too, you know? Yeah, that people I would help them do pain. the dishes too yeah, at the end. Exactly. <laughs> Desperately wanting to be in bed two hours ago. Um, social media yes. also pivotal in all this. Tell us yeah. about that briefly. Um I mean, social media, I think, has been pivotal in, in long COVID right from the get-go. Um, we wouldn't have the term long haulers. We wouldn't have the term long COVID if it weren't for social media and some of those fabulous early Facebook groups that were set up that gave us all validation at a time when we thought we were losing our minds and didn't know what was wrong with us. Um, and I never thought I would take medical advice from the internet. And yet that has been an absolute, you know, godsend of a resource. Um, yes, also, there are some negative things on there, people venting, people being toxic, and that can be very draining. And so you have to balance that. Um, but it has allowed me to connect with other people in the long COVID community, build new friendships and, and new working relationships, which have been enormously important. Um, I also started my own Facebook group um, gosh, a couple months back now, right around Thanksgiving. Um, and that is a place where we are talking about mind, body and polyvagal interventions for living with long COVID and recovering from long COVID. And we keep it a lovely safe space, uh, no venting, uh, sharing of, of positive uh, experiences and strategies and um, I record a, a weekly Wellness Wednesday video that goes out to my newsletter. It's also in that Facebook group. What's the um, name of the Facebook group? I think that's a really great question, Jim. Yeah. Uh, one of the joys of long COVID is the ongoing uh, cognitive impairment. So, uh, so they can go to your website. They can. I think it's Mind Body Strategies for long COVID recovery, something like that. It's got my name in it with yeah. Sally Riggs, um, but the link is definitely on our uh, on our website. website right? um, and also the link is there for signing up for our newsletter. Um, so I am definitely someone who, there have been times when, oh gosh, I'm on my phone too much and I should put it down and I should walk away and that that isn't helping my nervous system. Yeah. And yet, I think if we didn't have all of those communities, I, again, I wouldn't be well enough to sit here and talk to you. You know, there are great communities talking about the safe and sound protocol. Mm. There are great communities talking about polyvagal theory. Um, and all of the people that I have, um, you know, grown to network with in those communities also initially came through virtual interactions. So it, it has been uh, a, a real resource uh, f for this illness generally. I think, you know, long COVID essentially wouldn't exist without the internet. And that doesn't mean that it's a shared delusion. And mm. I know a lot about those because I used to work with psychosis and still do one day a week. Um, but more that sort of, you know, if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it must be a duck. Mm. And we all found each other and what a relief it was. Oh my goodness, we are all walking and quacking like ducks. Yeah. Very true. Why do you love this work so much? Why is it bringing you such blessing as you're helping others yeah. with their healing? I mean, I think also because 
it has afforded me so many opportunities for personal growth. And as a psychologist, obviously, I'd been in therapy for years. But I think the work that I've been forced to do personally in these last three years has been, you know, 10 times what I had done maybe in the 15 years before that. Um, and as I come to understand the role that energy plays, long COVID is an energy disease, and energy means so many things from a cellular level to a spiritual level. Um, and getting to understand those and being so much more open to different ways of thinking about things, shamanistic healing, um, you know, other kinds of spiritual practices, um, things that I would never have, have even considered. About, right? um, but when you're forced into a corner, suddenly your mind opens and you see a whole lot more. We've certainly done that with this conversation, haven't yeah. we? Yes, <laughs> this was yeah. fantastic. And Thank I appreciate you. your your, you know, your stamina because I know it's not necessarily easy. Thank you. This is one of the first things you've really done at this level. This yeah. even goes beyond the radio show. Yeah. Uh, but your openness and your willingness to share and to provide a sense of hope and healing for others who are watching who might right now be going through something similar. Yeah. And they're trying to figure out what is this? What am I feeling? Why do I have these emotional lapses? Why am I feeling physically the way that I am? Yeah. Uh, and I've tried all these different things to resolve it and nothing's working. And I need to talk to Sally. I think you're, you're coming to the studio and your willingness to do that with what you're experiencing. Um, just a true testament to the heart and soul of who you are. Thank you, Jim. Which is a beautiful thing. Thank you. I so, appreciate that. Um, you stay in touch with us. You know, keep us posted on everything Absolutely. that's happening. Absolutely. And I uh, wish you continued blessing and joy and good health. Thank you. And I think what you're doing is fantastic. I think the fact that also you've pivoted, you know, you haven't stepped fully away from psychology. You'll always yeah. have that background. But you've tweaked it to help people who are, again, underserved, who are really in need right now because this is such a yeah. monumental situation that we're going through. So thank you so really much. Really a blessing for the to have you here, Sally. Thank you. Good to see you smile too. Yeah. That's the plus. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Thanks. If you'd like to learn more and connect with our special guest Sally Riggs, visit her website, SallyRiggs.com. For close up television and radio, I'm Jim Masters. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you again next time.